Since the dawn of civilization, assassins and assassinations have played a pivotal role in shaping history. From the stabbing of Julius Caesar on the floor of the Roman Senate, to the shooting of Abraham Lincoln in the box seats at Ford's Theater, targeted killings have shaken nations and toppled empires. Contrary to portrayals in many movies and games, assassinations weren't always carried out by a shadowy rogue wielding a sharp dagger who snuck up behind the victim and then melted into the night once the deed was done. When you wanted someone dead, virtually any weapon would do, and it's rare that stealth played a part, at least in the hiding in shadows sense that requires some kind of skill check. I found a few intriguing murders from history that go beyond the stab in the back cliche and show that inventive ways of killing people aren't just limited to video games. Naturally, I don't suggest doing any of these in real life, but if you're looking for inspiration for your next role-playing game, you could do worse than following these creative examples. You might even get some bonus XP. Murder is a dirty job, and nowhere was that more evident than in the case of Godfrey the Hunchback, Duke of Lower Lorraine. Despite his physical limitations, Godfrey was a skilled military commander and competent ruler. In 1076, he was involved in a civil war in Holland against a young count named Dirk. On a chilly night in February, Godfrey was in the town of Vlardingen when, as sometimes happens during the late hours, he answered a call of nature. While the duke was dropping a duke, he was stabbed by an assassin who had positioned himself outside and underneath him. This illustration provides you with an idea of what an upper story medieval the tree might have looked like. Godfrey's poop shoot was probably shorter, allowing the assassin to use a spear to stab upwards and through to the Dutch Duke's Netherlands. He died one week after the attack, which many believe was orchestrated by Dirk or his ally and stepfather, Robert of Flanders. As a side note, while I was researching this piece, I learned that Wikipedia has a page dedicated to people who died on the toilet. And now, you know too. Anyway, Dirk would take advantage of the chaos to take control of all of West Frisia, where he would reign unopposed for another 15 years until his death in 1091. But you have to think that every time he visited a latrine, he glanced down through the hole just to make sure there was nothing sharp down there waiting for him. Sometimes, even an unsuccessful assassination can be notable for its ingenuity. Of course, not every would-be killer has the resources of an empire to try and pull off their nefarious deed. The Roman Emperor Nero is probably best known for fiddling while his city burned. That wasn't his only psychotic act, as he also tried to have his own mother murdered. That mother was Agrippina the Younger, also known as Julia Agrippina. She was the brother of the infamous Caligula and was believed to have murdered her husband, the Emperor Claudius, by poison. Claudius' successor, Nero, then murdered his stepbrother Britannicus, whom Agrippina favored, and then turned his sights toward his mother. First, he sent her a bed with a lead canopy that was intended to crush her. Then, inspired by plays featuring ships that were rigged to sink, he gifted her a boat that collapsed around her as she was returning from a dinner party with her son. Agrippina escaped the sinking ship, as well as Nero's thugs, who were sent out into the waters to make sure nobody survived. As it turns out, she was an excellent swimmer who made it to shore unharmed. She then sent a messenger to her son to let him know that she survived, and Nero, at wit's end by this point, had one of his men toss a sword at the messenger's feet and claim the man had been sent by his mother to kill him. So he simply sent some more thugs to bump her off in what he could credibly call self-defense. Upon being cornered, Agrippina reportedly pointed to her womb and told the killers to strike her there, insinuating that she wanted to destroy the part of her body that had given rise to a monster. One of the oldest tricks in the assassination playbook is to use an unwitting patsy to do the deed. How old? At least 2400 years old. This story arises to us from ancient Athens via a legal argument in the late 400s BC. The speaker is accusing his stepmother of two murders, of both his father and another man named Philoneos, who is the only person mentioned by name in the account. All of the relationships are a little difficult to track, so I've provided the visual aid. Philoneos was a friend of the speaker's father. Philoneos had a slave girl who had fallen out of his favor and whom he wanted to sell to a brothel. The girl wasn't a fan of this idea, so she went to the stepmother, who gave her a love potion that she could give Philoneos, and also the father who may have been getting bored with the stepmother, which would explain why she wanted to off him. The slave girl gave Philoneos an extra large dose of the potion because, as the record shows, making it a happy inspiration, she gave Philoneos the larger draft. 
She imagined perhaps if she gave him more, Philoneos would love her the more. For only when the mischief was done did she see that my stepmother had tricked her. Philoneos expired instantly, and my father was seized with an illness which resulted in his death twenty days later. The speaker claimed that it was his father's dying wish to punish his killer. Being only a minor at the time, he wasn't able to press his case until he reached adulthood several years later. In accusing his stepmother, he also lay blame on his half-brothers for not taking up the cause to avenge their father's death, even against their own mother. Unfortunately, only the argument of the accuser has survived through the ages. We don't know what kind of defense his stepmother put up, or whether she was ultimately found guilty or innocent. As for the slave girl, she was, quote, broken on the wheel and handed over to the executioner. Tip to any would-be assassins out there, unwitting or no, if you're going to do the deed, make sure to have a proper escape plan. Assassins come in all shapes and sizes, and use any number of weapons to achieve their goals. A servant administering poison or a stabbing in the night are common enough. Less common, however, is a bear with an axe. Jorgen Atch was a Swiss Protestant pastor in the early 1600s. During the Thirty Years' War, which raged across Central Europe from 1618 to 1648, he was involved in several brutal murders of Catholic rivals, such as the 1621 slaying of Pompeius von Planta, who was supposedly, quote, left pinned to the floor with an axe. It's not clear that Yanach was the axe man himself, but he still got most of the notoriety for the act. In 1635, Yanach converted to Catholicism, which unsurprisingly made him unpopular with his former Protestant allies, and he probably wasn't all that loved by the Catholics either, considering his past deeds. On January 24, 1639, he was in the town of Chur while the celebration of Carnival was going on. During that time, people would wear various masks or disguises as part of the festivities. That evening, five masked men entered the tavern Yanach was lounging in. One of them fired a gun at Yanach and grazed him. A second man, dressed as a bear, then raised an axe and struck Yanach in the skull. That brought him to the floor and the other men set to beating on him with hammers, just to make sure he was dead. Though he was never positively identified, the axe-wielding bear man was thought to be Rudolf von Planta, son of Pompeius von Planta, and he supposedly used the same axe that had killed his father 18 years earlier. Given the unnatural unpopularity, I'm guessing that the local police force did only the bare minimum to investigate his death. Our last assassination is easily the most elaborate. Unfortunately, it's also likely not true, but it's still a great story. King Kenneth II of Scotland was killed in 995, reportedly by nobles unhappy with changes he was trying to make to succession laws. That part of the story is pretty much accurate, but a legend has cropped up concerning the exact nature of his demise. According to medieval chronicler John of Fordoon, the king and his companions went on a hunt in the forest near the village of Fettercairn in Aberdeenshire. There lived a certain Lady Fennell, whose only son Kenneth had executed. When the king crossed her path, she got down on her knees and convinced him of her loyalty, saying that, What thou not long ago didst to my most wretched son, I know right well, was justly done, and not without cause. She claimed to have been approached by men conspiring against the king, and asked him to come to her home for a more private talk, where she could tell him all about the plots against him and name the traitors. The king agreed, and upon arriving in her home, his attention was drawn to a statue of a boy in the center of the room. Benel said of the statue, if the top of the head of the statue which thou seest, my lord king, be touched and moved, a marvelous and pleasant jest comes of it. The joke, however, was on King Kenneth. Naturally, he reached out to touch the statue, which had been carefully attached to several crossbows in the room, so that if the statue was nudged ever so slightly, they would fire. The king triggered the trap and was instantly killed, pierced by several crossbow bolts. The originator of this tale, John of Fordoon, lived nearly four centuries after Kenneth's death, which was probably the right amount of time for a routine assassination to morph into a fantastic tale of a vengeful mother and an inventive death trap. Another story added to the legend by claiming that Fennel was pursued to a cliff and leaped off it to her death, rather than allow herself to be captured. That cliff is now a waterfall named after her, called Den Fenella. True or not, there's a lot to admire about this tale. If not Fennell's creativity, then the creativity of whoever came up with the story. I found a lot of great sources for these accounts, so if you want to learn more, check out the links in the description below. I hope these stories give you some great ideas for the next time you want to assassinate someone. 
again, to stress in a game, not in real life. And even if assassination isn't your style, you'll at least know what to look for the next time a murderous emperor tries to give you a boat, or a woman whose son you kill pretends to be your friend. Again, just in a game. I hope. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video about assassinations, and be sure to check out the rest of the content here on Fantasy Roots. See you next time!